doing today? Good. It's good to see you all today. I noticed that Jordan didn't leave the candy up here. Did you all notice that? I just wanted to point that out. Do what, Jordan? Not for me. <clears throat> Probably don't need any. Man, I want to welcome everybody to Solid Rock Church this morning. Church family, it's always good to see you back. And, and I see a few of you that have had some physical obstacles here these last uh, few weeks and stuff. So it's a blessing certainly to have you back. And for a few new faces, some folks that are visiting maybe for the first time here to Solid Rock Church, thanks for being here. And uh, we hope that you'll fill out the yellow card you got at the front door. It's a visitor card. And We'll send you some information or reach out and say thank you for hanging out and visiting with us. Uh, I also just wanted for church family uh, to uh, bring you up to date. As you, as you know, here just uh, before my sabbatical in June, we moved two men of the church into eldership positions, eldership role. Brother Fred had stepped out of eldership. It left Rick and I, and we saw a great void with just Rick and I. Amen, Rick? Yeah, and so Jason and... Uh, George have stepped into the uh, elders' role. But what that did is in George, uh, 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 George stepping into that role, uh, George was also a trustee for us. And so that uh, opens up a trustee position. And so as we do here at Solid Rock Church uh, for church family, we would like to get feedback from church family on either you're interested in the trustee position or becoming a trustee, uh, or you think someone has the, the skills and abilities to, to be a trustee for us. And we'd like to hear from you over the next couple weeks uh, so that we can start moving towards uh, filling that trustee role. They just have to be a member of Solid Rock Church, having gone through the members class to be uh, within the uh, framework and under the umbrella of uh, leadership from, from the elders. And so... We're asking for feedback from you to fill in a trustee position. You can let any pastor know, Jordan or I or Jason, Matt, when he's back, just uh, let us know someone that you think would be faithful to fulfill that role. And just in case there's someone here that's a part of church family, you know, the trustee role is as a position that oversees uh, the money issues of the church, uh, looks at expenditures, and is kind of about the business part side of church. And so if you know someone like that, we'd sure be interested in talking to them. Amen? No, that was all the fun, sexy stuff of ministry, you know, all the business stuff. So, but we, we really value that. And, and the trustee position kind of serves in the context of, of a deacon role. Uh, if you look back into the, the, the Bible, it is a representative from the congregation in general. Your trustees are a way for you as the congregation to have some oversight within the money expenditures. Amen? Jason, what you got? Ladies can be trustees, yes. We have a great lady back there, Jody Howard, who is a trustee. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Jody. Lord knows that she, she keeps those trustee men down and, and kind of keeps them in, in order and stuff. Look how well-behaved Tommy is. Amen? Yeah. Hey, Tommy wants to testify, but probably not the right time, brother. You know what I'm saying? So, hey, we'd like to do that in the next couple weeks. So think and, and give us feedback if you have some feedback. Amen? Man, thank you for that. So we continue on a journey uh, here in this sermon series of, at, at looking at what does Solid Rock Church as a local church in the community, what do we embrace, what do we teach, and what do we see the scriptures revealed to us and how do we practice that in a doctrinal statement and in how we live out our faith life. Our doctrine guides our faith life, if you will. Um, and so we're on uh, the third of seven sermons focused on the primary doctrinal positions of Solid Rock Church. So just for those that uh, may have missed the very first one, uh, I want to remind you the definition of doctrine. Doctrine is defined as the body of principles in a branch of knowledge or a system of belief. These are principles. These are foundations. These are touchstones. These are the anchors that we hold on to within the whole broad breadth of what we call faith in Christendom. And there's other churches that practice some other doctrinal positions which are not in huge conflict with ours, but may be a little different than ours. And then there are some that practice some doctrinal positions that are just an error based on what the Scriptures say. So for us here at Solid Rock Church, our doctrine 
is the biblical guidelines for our lives. If you got to go and hear Jason teach this morning in the expository class, Jason will have brought into uh, uh, the, the, uh, Luke 9, I think is where you guys are at. Luke 9, the book of Luke chapter 9 and whatever he taught on, and I wasn't in the class, but he'll, he'll do that from the perspective of a doctrinal statement, a position that we take within the truth of Scripture. So today we'll explore our position, Solid Rock's church's position, on who is the Holy Spirit and how does the Holy Spirit interact in our lives. Probably no big surprise to you, the, last, the two previous sermons were God the Father and then God the Son, Jesus, last week, and today we'll talk about God the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was revealed to us in the Scriptures in the very earliest part of Scripture. How about Genesis chapter 1, verse 2? You can't go much earlier in the Scriptures, amen? So Genesis 1, 2 says, The earth was out form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Well, what does exactly that mean, Pastor Bill? I don't know. I don't know exactly. But it's the Holy Spirit hovered when creation was not fully complete. Creation as we know God going through the six days of creation. So when the, the, the Solid Rock Church doctrinal statement on the Holy Spirit is this, quote, we believe that the Holy Spirit is co-equal with the Father and the Son of God. He is present and alive in the world today, making men, and by implication women, aware of their need for a relationship with Jesus Christ. He also lives in every Christian from the moment of salvation. I continue uh, in our uh, doctrinal uh, statement here. He says, He, the Holy Spirit, provides Christians with power for living, understanding of spiritual truth, and guidance in doing what is right. He is the source of all spiritual gifts and appropriates them to every believer who will do his ministry. We believe that all spiritual gifts are operative in God's church today. As Christians, we are to seek intimate fellowship and communion with the Holy Spirit and to live under His control daily. End quote. Man, that might be a seven-part sermon series just in our doctrinal statement about the Holy Spirit. Amen? And I want to touch on several points that you just heard. It's not a super in-depth study of the Holy Spirit, but that we make some pretty defined statements that are in conflict with other churches in the world today. So we support our position, we support our statement that I just read uh, it, from the Scriptures. And you can look over these Scriptures later on. These are the Scriptures that are reflected um, and used to be able to gain the perspective and understanding of our doctrinal position. And so those will be up just for a couple minutes as you frantically write those down, because I'm about to move on to another slide. And if you want those and you didn't get them all, get with me a little later. Jesus, in the New Testament, introduces us to the new role the Holy Spirit came into when Jesus was preparing to leave. He was getting ready to go to His crucifixion. He was preparing the disciples for His eventually leaving them, which they didn't totally get. And so we find Jesus in John chapter 14, verses 25 and 26, in that conversation with the disciples. And he says, These things I have spoken to you, the disciples, while I am still with you. Jesus is still here. But the helper, now notice in the verse, the helper is, uh, but the helper, capital H, should give you an indication, the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrances all that have said to you. So you'll remember that many times we as a fellowship, we talk about the Scriptures, and one primary way for us to hear and understand the Scriptures is in the context of the Scriptures, right? So I want to kind of point out that last uh, portion of that. Uh, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things. So when Jesus is saying this to the disciples, He's preparing the disciples to be the ones to go out into the world, taking the message, the gospel message, uh, to the world. 
So he will teach you all things. The Holy Spirit was going to teach the disciples all things they needed to know, and he was going to bring to your remembrance what I've said to you. The Holy Spirit in the moment, have you had those moments to when you're talking to somebody, maybe about Jesus and and, and you're, you're, you're sharing a truth, and all of a sudden you say something, blah, 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 and you go like, wow, I didn't remember knowing that. And it is, maybe it's a Scripture verse, or maybe it's a truth from Scripture. Well, that is the Holy Spirit bringing to remembrance all the things that Jesus has said to you through the Scriptures. So the application here certainly is for the disciples in the day who will take the message, the gospel message, and spread it throughout the world. But for you and I, the Holy Spirit continues to teach us, and the Holy Spirit, as we read Scripture, as we study Scripture, as we come into more understanding of the Scriptures, and maybe it's kind of new and it blows your mind and you're not sure about it, then all of a sudden you're talking to somebody and you go, blah, 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 blah. And it was a Holy Spirit bringing to your remembrance a portion of Scripture or scriptural truth. Have you had that happen before? Yeah, yeah. And I want you to know if that hasn't happened for you, it can happen for you. But you know, if you don't feed the mind with Scripture, if we don't take time to study the Scripture then the Holy Spirit doesn't have anything to bring up to your mind, right? Right? That's right. So if you're a professional in here, you have a job, and you have some job that has a certain base of knowledge. If you don't know your job, how can you go do your job? Well, our part of our job as believers is not just to soak in the glory of Jesus in our lives, and that's kind of nice, right? But our job is to take the Word of God out into a dying world, and you need some tools, and the tools... One primary tool is the Word of God. You need to be reading your Scriptures. Oh, you say that every weekend, Pastor Bill. Yes, I do. And so you need to know I'm not going to relent until you start reading your Scriptures if you're not. Amen? The Bible reveals the Holy Spirit is truly a person. That is, He is a personal individual rather than an impersonable, impersonal thing. We see that because every pronoun used in reference to the Holy Spirit is He, not It. And we see this, uh, for example, revealed in the book of John several times. I'll use at least this one scripture. I'm going to read from John chapter 16, verse 13. There it says, When the Spirit of truth, that's another name for the Holy Spirit, by the way. When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all the truth, for He will not speak on His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will declare to you the things that are to come. Notice the, the, the wording used in that scripture that should be up on the screen right there. That Jordan has that wide look on his eyes, which means it may not be up there. What I hope you heard as I read that scripture was a lot of the he references, talking to an individual. But also I want to point out in this verse that's still not up... Uh, that there are action words of an individual in that verse. And so you can refer to that verse later on when you read John 16, verse 13. You'll see words like, He guides, He speaks, He hears, He declares. Those are action words that you will see from individuals. Those are things that real live like people or real live entities do. And so these are, gives more individuality and more structure to who the Holy Spirit is. The Holy Spirit can also be grieved. We see this in Ephesians 4, verse 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. That aspect of being grieved speaks to an, a level of, of personhood or a level of individuality. We, you know, in, in, Inanimate objects don't get grieved, right? But we've been grieved as people, as human beings. We grieve God, we can grieve Jesus, but we can grieve the Holy Spirit also. The Holy Spirit functions in our lives as a comforter and a counselor. Jesus promised us those things, and we'll see that in our next slide from John 14. I'm going to read John 14, verse 16, and then skip down to verse 26. So verse 16 says, now Jesus speaking, I will ask the Father, and He will give you another helper, to be with you forever. Holy Spirit is not temporarily in your life. 
The Holy Spirit is present in your life moment by moment. So he is defined or identified as a helper. Also, going further down in John 14 to verse 26, Jesus continues, But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I've said to you. We talked about that earlier. So that promise earlier that I talked about was Jesus talking to the Holy, uh, part, part, talking to the uh, disciples about the Holy Spirit. But now we can also, there's an application for us. As we have surrendered our life to Jesus, and in that moment of surrender, in that moment of salvation, Holy Spirit comes to live in our lives. And now the Holy Spirit becomes our guide, our counselor, our comforter. It is maybe sometimes we have those moments when we're about to do something and we go, uh, maybe I shouldn't do that. We might say sometimes that's our conscience. I would suggest to you that's the Holy Spirit offering an insight saying, yeah, probably not a good idea. Don't do that. And those moments when we are about to act or about to say something and we give pause, we feel that check in our spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. And so if you haven't had that experience, I might ask, have you fully surrendered your life to Jesus? Which is, has to happen. Salvation has to happen before the Holy Spirit comes to reside in you. And or are you reading your scripture? Are you studying scripture? Are you allowing God to really have control of your lives. Now, we should be prepared for questions about what some teach is a separate event called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Some churches teach that salvation comes first and then a second separate event occurs later after salvation called baptism of the Holy Spirit. And that is taught in the context of two separate events. Now, we don't teach that particular doctrine here at Solid Rock Church. We teach the full presence and indwelling of the Holy Spirit happens at salvation. You say yes to Jesus because Jesus is the instrument. Jesus is the way to salvation, right? Jesus is on the cross and at the very end, but right before he dies, he says, it's finished. Now, there's a beautiful study on what does that mean? It is finished. His suffering is finished? Yes, I think that's part of that word. It is finished more on a larger scale is the work of what Jesus came to do is finished. There's nothing else other than Jesus dying on the cross. There's nothing else to do. It is accepting Jesus' death. It is accepting that He is who He says He is. And it is surrendering our lives to Jesus. Our position on salvation and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit happened at the same time comes from 1 Corinthians 12. I'll read from verses 12 and 13. Again, now Paul is teaching the church at Corinth. And he says, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greek, free or slave, and all were made to drink. So Paul is here talking to a group of believers. So the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is reserved for believers. Amen? Yeah, there's, no, there's no leading of the Holy Spirit. There's no interaction of the Holy Spirit for non-believers because they have not received the Holy Spirit at that point. All have been baptized into the Spirit is what Paul is saying. If you're a believer in Jesus, this Wording here of baptized in the Holy Spirit means received. The Holy Spirit has come into you, and that's for all believers in the Lord Jesus. The Holy Spirit happens and comes in and indwells at the moment of salvation. It is not described or is not a special separate experience. Now, there's a whole other study on that, and there's some scriptures that those who practice that particular doctrine pull out of scripture, but they don't I think look at the context of those scriptures. That's not for today, but for our doctrinal position, we teach and believe and embrace that at the moment you say yes to Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes to reside in you. It is possible for our sin to quench the Holy Spirit. That's described in 1 Thessalonians 5.19. That won't come up. We talked a little earlier about the ability to grieve the Holy Spirit. Again, we saw that earlier in Ephesians 4.30. 
we must understand, even as believers in Jesus, as we go through life, when we stumble, when we make wrong choices, we can have consequences for our sin. The consequences is a broken relationship with the Lord. Now, the Lord never leaves us nor forsakes us. Amen? That's part of the good news. But that we can, we can grieve the Holy Spirit. We can create a barrier with active sin or sins of action in our lives with our Heavenly Father. Unconfessed sin in our lives can hinder our fellowship with God and effectively quench the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. How does that play out? Well, that's a, I think that's another long sermon, but sometimes I know I've had moments in my life where I have drifted away from the Lord and that I don't hear the Holy Spirit, I don't sense the Holy Spirit, I'm seeking out in my prayer life where to go and what to do, and I don't feel like I have any guidance. It's usually because I've drifted away, I've somehow offended or, or sinned in my life, and I've created an obstacle to effectively hearing from the Lord. When we confess our sins to God, He is faithful to from 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He, God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all righteousness. That's the beauty, I think, in the, in the relationship as a, as a believer in the Lord Jesus. Is there'll be moments in our humanity, in our moments of still being wrapped in the flesh, that we've been forgiven and we're redeemed and we're fully accepted by the Father, but that we can go out and we can trip and stumble, we can make a bad choice, we can be uh, unaware of, of, of uh, things going on around us and step off into the world of sin. And then that moment when we recognize it, if we'll confess our sin. Father, I confess that I am in sin. I am in agreement with you, Lord, about this. He, God, is faithful to forgive us of our sins. That's, that's the ongoing cleaning process that we have in our lives, church. You know, and sometimes what do we do sometimes when we step off into sin? We, we, we know that we stepped off into sin. We feel shame, and somehow we try to hide that from the Father, don't we? Can I just encourage you, if that's you today, I want to encourage you that the Father knows that you sinned. Amen? We can't surprise God. And part of that humility, part of that, frankly, part of a maturity that we bring in our faith life is to come before the Father saying, man, Lord, I, I, I bumbled and stumbled into it again. I stepped into a big old pile of sin right here, Lord, and it's all over me. Lord, I want to confess that I've drifted away, Lord. You know what? The scripture, the image in the scriptures is that if we'll turn from our sin and turn back to the Father, that He'll run to meet us where we're at. Isn't that a great image? That He's not going to make you crawl on your hands and knees back to Him. He's eager to receive you back. He desires for you to come back and to be in that relationship with Him so that He can have the intimate connection with you. I like to be reminded sometimes the names of the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm going to, there'll be some, a slide come up here in just a second. Uh, uh, the names of the, man, there's a tremendous study you can do in your own home is to look up and research and do some reading on all the names of the Holy Spirit. And these names often speak to the function of the Holy Spirit. So here's some names and titles of the Holy Spirit that are coming up right now. And when, you know, when you say right now and the sound booth is going like that, you know you might be in trouble. So that slide will, and, and, and I, I want to acknowledge just some technical challenges we've been having that we're trying to resolve. Trustees will be getting a little notice about some new tech equipment, but that's another story for another time. And so we have a little bit of a slowdown. So if you're taking notes, as you all should be, some names and titles of the Holy Spirit, you're going to see comforter, or counselor, Advocate could kind of come up, but that's one title, if you will. And that kind of implies that these words are, are from the original Greek language and from the word paraclete. That's another name of the Holy Spirit. And that term paraclete describes function, comforter, counselor, advocate. And, and the, while those are kind of interconnected in function, but there's a little difference in each of those. Amen. Sometimes we'll hear the, the term or the name of the Holy Spirit, convictor of sin. That's not one of my favorites, okay? But, uh, but it is one that is an important one. Because I think sometimes if we're kind of negotiating out in the world and we're, 
where maybe we ha- you have a secular job and you're just in kind of a place that you're just kind of moving along through life and all of a sudden we get into an area we're not sensitive to but we start to feel a conviction of sin in our life. We see that revealed to us in John 16, verses 7 through 11, which won't come up. But the Spirit applies the truth of God to men's and women's minds in order to convince them by sufficient and fair arguments that they are in sin. The Holy Spirit will appeal to us to look at a part of our lives, a thing we're actively engaged in, a thought process that we're in, and will convict us and reveal to us that nature maybe of that particular sin. So part of the function of Holy Spirit is convictor of sin. We see another aspect of the Holy Spirit, and I just titled it indweller of believers. And there are several scriptures in Romans and Ephesians and 1 Corinthians where we see this image. The Holy Spirit resides in the hearts of God's people. And that that indwelling is the distinguishing characteristic of a regenerated person. The Holy Spirit's presence in our lives is a way that we can look at others and see them working and negotiating within the sphere of the Holy Spirit's influence. There's those titles coming up, and I'll just touch base on all those. So it sounds kind of weird. Some people get a little weirded out about that. The Holy Spirit lives in me. Ooh, I don't know if I like that. Well, I just want to encourage you that that provides your moral compass is one way I like to think of it. It gives me direction in my life. And when I'm heading down the road of life and I think I'm just doing a great job and all of a sudden that internal guide starts to raise a red flag, I go like, what's up? What's going on? It makes me stop and think about what I'm about to say or continue to do. The Holy Spirit can redirect me in those moments. Another aspect or another a way that we identify the Holy Spirit as a, he's, he's described as a deposit or a seal in our lives. Uh, that scripture references the 2 Corinthians 1 and Ephesians 1. The Holy Spirit is God's seal, His mark on His own people. God claims us as His people, and an identifying Um, image or sign of that is the Holy Spirit's presence in our lives. And so when we as God's people, when the Holy Spirit is active in our lives and when we're sensitive to it, we'll be sensitive to the Holy Spirit in other people's lives. Amen? It's a discernment that we can have. Hey, look, we live in a world where a lot of people claim to be Christians. Amen? That they don't even know Jesus, they don't understand Jesus, and they've never given their lives to Jesus, but they'll call themselves Christians. How do we discern that? by their actions and by our Holy Spirit, having a sensitivity to that other person's Holy Spirit. By the way, married people, this is for free. The Holy Spirit resides in your spouse. Why are you giggling already? I hadn't even said anything. And so sometimes, this might be true in married life, sometimes there's something known as conflict in marriage. I know most of you hadn't had that. There's a difference of opinion, and I'm here to tell you today there's a difference between men and women, amen? And so sometimes that natural uh, brokenness of living in the world, our own failing shortcomings, we start to kind of grind a little bit with each other. I want to remind us all that the Holy Spirit in my spouse is consistently in agreement with the Holy Spirit in my life. The Holy Spirit is never at odds with Himself. Therefore, if I'm at odds with my wife, it's not a spiritual issue, It's a flesh issue. It's me wanting to get my way on the rare occasion my wife wanting to get her way. That becomes a working point, amen? Man, all the married people, they're over there nudging each other and they're looking at each other and pointing at each other and stuff. But I think that's important to remember because for a married person here today, if you've really said yes to Jesus, if you've submitted your life to Jesus and you're not doing life perfect, because none of us are, amen? But if you're walking down the road and you start to have some conflict in your marriage, that's a good point to stop and say, what's up? What's going on? And have that conversation with your spouse. Amen? The Holy Spirit we've talked about is defined also as a guide. The Holy Spirit promises to guide believers to know and understand the truth of Scripture. It is the Holy Spirit starting to change the way that we think, starting to be active in our lives to be able to help to the Scriptures unfold and make sense to us. 
Do the scriptures confuse you sometimes? All of God's people said, a a whole lot, Pastor Bill. Well, me too. But I know more today than I knew yesterday or a year ago or 10 years ago. And so it is a continual unfolding of God's truth and the depth of God's truth. Holy Spirit is described as the author of Scripture. 2 Peter 1, Timothy 3, the Bible is inspired, which means literally God breathed out onto mankind. And that that breathing out was the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit guided the hands of men to write the Scriptures. It is the guidance of God through the Holy Spirit in men's lives. So the age-old question, who wrote the Scriptures? God or man? And the answer is yes. It is men submitted and in relationship with God. By the way, none of the books in the Bible were written by unbelievers. Amen? I mean, some people don't even get that basic truth. But men submitted to God who have allowed the Holy Spirit to work and reveal to them spiritual truths. It's my my personal belief, so I'm just going to say this on the side, that in some of the actual writings of the original writer of the Scriptures, they didn't fully understand what they were writing. But that the hand of God guided those writings that has application for all of us as believers. Lastly, for today, on the names of the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit is called the intercessor. We see it in Romans 8, 26. One of the most encouraging and comforting aspects of the Holy Spirit, I think, is His ministry of intercession on behalf of those that He indwells. Holy Spirit's part of His job is to keep us out of trouble. Amen? I'm just saying for me, that's a daily action, right? The Holy Spirit keeping me out of trouble. But that He goes before and that the Holy Spirit opens doors. Have you had those moments? You've been at at Walmart and you're trying to check out and there's 42 people ahead of you and there's only one line open. Everybody ever been there? Yeah, I'm not even going to go down that road too much today, amen? But you finally get to that frayed, worn out, frustrated clerk, and you're just about to take a gulp of air and to say, how come nobody's up here helping you? And you stop and you look and say, man, it's been a hard day, hasn't it? And she just starts to weep. That's a Holy Spirit moment to where you've set aside your personal frustrations, and it is frustrating, and you said something you were not really thinking about saying. And all of a sudden, God works there. Those divine appointments. You know those divine appointments? You're tripping through life and you're just negotiating, thinking you got A, B, and C to do today. And God puts somebody in your life and you're going like, how come I'm meeting with this person right now? How, how come I'm interacting with this person? How come this person's interacting with me that I don't even know? And I think we got to be careful not to rush by that real quick. The unplanned divine appointments in our life. Rick's talked a little bit about that before. I've appreciated his insight. And that something just unfolds in the very moment right before us. And even in our maybe our own frustration, our own uh, feeling of hurriedness in life, and we live in a society that's a hurried lifestyle. We take a deep breath and we say, let's just sit down and talk a moment. How are you doing? You look like you're frustrated. How's your day been on somebody you don't even know? Or as importantly, somebody comes up and starts to tell you about their day, and you're going like, who are they talking to? I don't know this. If you had that moment, I'm going to encourage you to slow down and just receive that. Some of you in your positions at work, you're a, you're a boss or you're a leader, you're a teacher, you're a, you, you do something that is seen in some type of position of responsibility or leadership, and somebody, one of your folks, employees, one of the people that's around you comes and starts to unpack their day, and you're going like, this is outside the normal bounds of what I do in my job. Divine appointment. I don't know what happens. You have to discern what happens in that moment, but keep those out. That's part of the intercessor, I think. Because all of us, in some form or fashion, were led to Jesus by someone that was a believer. Someone that was a believer shared their faith or unpacked something for us or spent a little time with us. And that may have not been an unplanned moment in your life. It may not have been a a divine appointment that you remember, but maybe God was at work there. And that that teacher, that boss, that supervisor, that co-worker slowed down, set aside, took some time with you. 
Those are really important moments in people's lives, church. Be aware of those. The Holy Spirit is that voice that we hear as we journey through life. So one of the big conversations I've had in my office many, many times, and I ask people at some point in the conversation, what's the voice in your head say to you? And so sometimes the voice that they hear is a condemning voice. You're a loser. You'll never amount to anything. You can't do it. If you were a real Christian, you wouldn't do it. God would attack you. It's what that voice will say. But the Scriptures don't say that. Because God is not an accuser. He's not a, he's not a God of accusations. He's a God of love. And so if that voice in your head is calling you names, if that is an accusing voice, it is a true voice, but it's not God. And it only leaves one person. Yeah, the enemy. Because as Jordan said in his children's sermon, the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So what's the voice that you hear in your mind saying to you? Because you must discern the voice, right? And if the voice is calling you to a better walk with God, if the voice is revealing things in your life that you know are true and that are not good for you, it is responding to the voice of encouragement, guidance, and hope. That's the Holy Spirit's job. Because God loves you. That's what the Scriptures say. God loves you. God really does love you. And I don't know what you've done, and it doesn't matter to me what you've done. And you may feel great guilt over what you've done. God still loves you. God still calls you to Him because He wants a relationship with you. Well, you don't know, Pastor, you don't know what I've done, and I don't. You don't know how bad I've been, and I don't. But God does. And here's the truth of the Word of God. No matter what you've done, He still calls you to Himself. He wants to embrace you and love you. He wants to spend the rest of your time here on this earth with Him. Certainly, He wants to spend eternity with you. Don't get by that message too quick. Well, I was with God when I was young, but I drifted away and did some stupid stuff, and I'm still doing stupid stuff. God knows. God still loves you. And I'm not saying there's not consequences for stupid stuff, amen? I have a long list of consequences for my stupid stuff. But in my consequences, God never stopped loving me. I just want to encourage you in that. I think sometimes we get caught up in life, we get distracted in life, we get overwhelmed with things in life, and all of a sudden we're, maybe we've drifted from God and we're going like, man, what happened? It doesn't feel the same. God still loves you. It's a matter of turning and going back to God. And that's what we do every Sunday here. In some way, we try to reconnect us with God. Amen? It's a, it's a moment we come together in, in a relatively safe place to where we can say the name of Jesus and not get attacked by the world. Amen? It's a moment we come back and get a little refreshment, a little invigoration to go back out into a dying world out here that probably will beat you up for saying anything about Jesus. And that's for a lot of reasons. Those are many more sermons. But today I want to remind you of your anchor. God loves you. God cares about you. Listen to the voice that guides, encourages, cautions. And yes, in some ways, maybe the voice that even convicts us. See, the voice of conviction about our sins is a different voice than accusations. Does that make sense? When something in my life is opened up before me and I go like, oh, that's a part of my life I was unaware of. And that's, that, that looks a lot like sin. I don't want to confess necessarily to sin, but it looks a lot like sin. That's the Holy Spirit's job is to reveal something that is apart from God. Amen? Because one can, Thank you, Vicki. I appreciate that. I've been missing your voice. Good to see you again. We need to hear and learn to respond to that voice, the voice of the guide, the paraclete, the
the voice of He who resides in us. That voice that guides us in all things back to the Father. And as we pause and and prepare to go to prayer time, we just want to open up as we close as we do each Sunday uh, with a time of prayer. And so in the prayer time today, I guess I have on my mind any of us that have drifted away from the Lord a little bit. Any of us that have put up a little barrier saying, well, you know, I'm really a pretty good Christian and don't really want to look at this part of my life, but boy, look over here how good this is. But the Spirit brings us back to this place. Today's a great day to unload some baggage, to unload some things that have separated us from the Lord. I could, I could try to get a long list together, and I'm not even going to do that. Because you know really in your heart what has separated you. pushed God out of your life, allowed something in. Maybe it's a secular, cultural thing that we face every day in the culture that's kind of created a wedge between you and God. Maybe it's inattentiveness to the Lord. Maybe it's not taking the time to get to know our Heavenly Father or the Lord Jesus in a better way. And we can take care of that today. And today in our prayer time, maybe there's something that you're suffering with right now. And I look over and uh, I, I know that uh, uh, Renee is in the house and uh, her son was in a motorcycle accident and he's going to be okay, but he's really banged up and he's got a long road to heal. And so uh, I know that's a lot on her mind. And so those are great moments for the folks right there around Renee and Kenny and Charlene to rally around and this is how we pray and take care of each other. And maybe there's some other folks here got some physical things going on. I just want to encourage you, would you be vulnerable vulnerable enough to, to let somebody know what you're suffering with and let them pray for you? You can do that at your tables and we're going to encourage you to do that. And Maybe you'd prefer someone that, that you don't know to pray for you. Sometimes that's a little bit of a relief. And I think Fred has already beat me to the punch. Fred would be more than available to pray for you today. If you would like prayer, Fred to pray for you, Cody's going to be up by the coffee bar, I hope. Oh, I, I called him out and he wasn't ready for that. Cody, would you go to the coffee bar and be available? <laughs> Cody who's always at the coffee bar when I come to this point, was not at the coffee bar, but Co- Cody would love to pray for you. <laughs> He's always got to be ready. And I see Miss Marty's in the back. Thank you, Marty. Marty would be available to pray for any ladies or anybody that would need some prayer. If you need someone to pray with you, and I'll be over here, up by the door over here, the exit door in case I need to get out quick. And I'll just be available. There's no magic in any of us, just, just an availability. You can pray for people right around you. And if you know somebody has a need and you don't have a need, go pray for them. Because we need to be more about our prayer. Amen. So I'm going to ask you to rise and just be still before the Lord and let people move around as people see the need. And we will let the Lord minister.